Welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. We're very happy today to welcome back to the Westminster Institute Dr. Stephen Bryan, who's a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. He is a leading expert in security strategy and technology. He has held senior positions in the Department of Defense on Capitol Hill and as the president of a large multinational defense and technology company. He served as a senior staff director of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as head of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, and as deputy undersecretary of defense for trade security policy, and as founder and director of the Defense Technology Security Administration. <clears throat> Among other books, he is the author of Technology, Security, and National Power, winners and losers. Dr. Bryan was twice awarded the highest acknowledgement from the U.S. Department of Defense, <clears throat> receiving the Distinguished Service Medal. He is the chairman of the panel of experts for the study Stopping a Taiwan Invasion, which is the subject of our conversation today. Steve, welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be with you. This is a very extensive report with a truly impressive panel of senior retired generals, admirals, and other defense experts. That's right. And you're the chairman of it, so. I was the co-chairman of it. Or the co-chairman. Yeah. Lieutenant right. General Earl Halston, who's the uh, Marine general, was the co-chairman. So the two of us. Uh, and we met over a period of, I guess, close to three months. Um, usually using Zoom because these days that's much more quick. They're scattered around the country. Uh, it was much more convenient. And we spent hours and hours on the, our posture in the Pacific, and specifically Taiwan, looking at that. And all of them had extensive... All of them, uh, yes, without exception. They all served in the Pacific as commander of the, the Air Force in the Pacific, you know, naval commander in the Pacific, marine commanders in the Pacific. Uh, Army general commander of an uh, army in Pacific. So they all have the extensive on the ground, you know, or on the seas, I guess you could say, or in the air experience, uh, deep experience in the region. None of them are political. This is not a political study. We, you know, we avoided that like the plague. The idea wasn't to do politics. The idea was to do international strategy and to try and understand whether or not it's possible to defend Taiwan. That was the great question. Uh, the background, I should talk a minute about the Please. background. Uh, there have been a number of studies uh, done by some prestigious uh, organizations like RAND, uh, some done by the military services, some of them are war games, some of them are simulations, some are just papers. But all of them seem to say, you know, if we fight in the Pacific, we're going to lose. That was the, that's the, the message. And we, you know, we started this saying, are we going to lose? Because if that's, you know, going to happen, you know what, the decision making will be very negative. The U.S. will try and back away from any commitments. It will not do what's necessary. And the result is going to be a catastrophe. Or is there an alternative to that? And in fact, even is that true? Are we going to really lose? Or is that an exaggeration? So we, we, we addressed that head on because that was the mission. And, and we tried to look at all the services, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. Now, they're not all perfect. Nothing's perfect in this world. And, and, and the U.S. has let some of its major assets decline, considerably decline either because we've been in too many wars and stuff is worn out, which is one of the reasons, or there hasn't been sufficient budget to buy new equipment, which is another reason. Uh, but however you look at it, we have some deficits. But even with those deficits, we wanted to know, could we prevail in a conflict? Or better yet, instead of say prevail, uh, could we deter China from getting into a conflict? Because I think the game is... The, Ch the Chinese don't think Taiwan's their enemy. They think we're their enemy, to be honest. And, and they think that if, if we can be intimidated 
and we pull back, then China will command that whole, uh, what's called the first island chain in, in the Pacific. And, and we'll basically control Japan and South Korea and everybody in Indonesia and the Philippines and Vietnam, all the way down to Australia, if they can push us out. So I think they want to push us out. And, and secondly, the Chinese are not exactly a pro-democracy crowd, as you probably know. <laughs> and, and, and they deeply resent the democracies that are operating in, in places like Japan and Taiwan. Taiwan, by the way, is a very vigorous democracy today. And the liberal democracy, they consider a threat to the Chinese approach to, to single party dictatorships. So that's their enemy, plus us. And uh, that's what they're trying to do. And that's where we started. Well, as is often said, the Chinese objective is victory without war, which would mean precisely intimidating us, deterring us, making us feel that it would be a fruitless endeavor to join in the defense of Taiwan. And um, you indicated with your opening remarks that to some extent, they have succeeded in that so many people think uh, such a war would be lost and That's the United right. States would be defeated in its effort to to defend uh, Taiwan. <clears throat> so have we already been deterred? Have we the U.S.? Uh, yes. Can't say. Not sure. I, I, think, I think that's still open to some question. Um, look, the, the, the Chinese are building up their military power and with lots of sophisticated weapons. It looks very formidable. There's no doubt about that. And it's going to get more formidable. I mean, unless something big happens in China, we don't necessarily anticipate an economic collapse or some internal uh, conflict inside of China, which we can't predict today. But assuming that they're on the same trajectory, they're going to keep that buildup going and keep introducing new weapons. So. We can't stand still. You, you can't, you can't uh, deal with the uh, 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 situation by being static. You, you, know, you have to be dynamic, because they're dynamic. You know, they're on, a, or they're on the make. They're a country, a rising country from a military point of view, and and you know we're a status quo country from a military point of view. But that doesn't mean that we can't keep improving. So that's the, I think that's the environment. Yes. And what your very impressive report lays out in about 80 pages seems to be what would need to be done on the part of the United States and its allies in the Pacific to deter That's China right. from such an invasion, or if it were to occur, to prevail in that conflict. Well, that, that brings up really, before getting into the nitty gritty yes. parts, that brings up a crucial concept. All those studies that were done by the Pentagon and by the RAND and by think tanks around town and that sort of thing, all those studies presume a U.S. expeditionary force operating on its own. That's a fundamental assumption. That's a wrong assumption. Let's start there. If we're going to operate on our own, yes, we're going to lose. I agree. There's no doubt about it. How do you coordinate with the Japanese? How do you coordinate with the Taiwanese? How do you coordinate with the Koreans or anybody else for that matter? If you're, if you're going to just come in there and try to save the day, you know, a kind of a, a Lone Ranger style, I guess, isn't going to work. It doesn't work that way. Not anymore. I mean, look what's going on in, in Ukraine where the, the Russians have been unable to coordinate their own forces, let alone others. So, uh, no, we have to be coordinated with our allies. And most importantly, we have to include Taiwan. You, you can't, you can't uh, neglect Taiwan. You know, Taiwan is a, is a strong, small, but a, you know, it's 26 million people. It's not that small, but geographically it's small. It's a small country with a strong army, a strong air force, not so strong navy, but reasonably decent. But on the whole, they will fight, but they need to fight with us, not by themselves. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the, one of the Washington theories that you may have heard in the past, well, the Taiwan probably can hold out for two weeks and then maybe we can come in and help them. Uh-uh. That's not, that's not strategy. That's a, that's a recipe for a defeat. Because, you know, f to go against the, the entire weight of the Chinese military, the army, the navy, 
the missiles, everything, missile forces, uh, by themselves. Two weeks is a long time. And anyway, they shouldn't be fighting by themselves. I think that the, the answer is they have to fight with us. They have to be trained by us. Uh, they, they have to coordinate with us. We've said you need a single coordinated command for Asia. That includes Taiwan. That indeed is number two on the findings and recommendations of this study. If I could just read it. Please. Uh, to assure peace and stability, the U.S. should take the lead in creating a common command for East Asia, one that includes allies, friends, and Taiwan. That's actually a very provocative proposal. Well, we weren't trying, we weren't no, no, trying to were, be provocative. No, no, but you're, you're we're trying you're, to tell the truth. You're trying to tell the truth. One reaction to that uh, requirement might be that instituting such a thing as a common command with uh, Taiwan and I presume Japan, maybe Australia, and that's uh, right. Uh, would, would provoke the very conflict it's meant to deter because as soon as the Chinese see this, uh, they might react, we better do this before they get their act together. Well, you have to weigh that against if you don't do anything, what it provokes. And, you know, every day the Chinese are now challenging Taiwan. They're, they're flying uh, fighters and bombers around the island. They're doing massive naval exercises, including with their new aircraft carrier. Uh, they're trying to keep us out of the Taiwan Straits. I mean, they're doing everything they can to push. Uh, I think that's a lot more dangerous than a common command system. I mean, I don't, I don't see where the Chinese will, will, no, they won't like it and they will bitterly oppose it, but they can't do anything about it. But absent that common command structure. Real problems, real problems. Real, yes. That's it. And, and, you know, you don't have to do it on the front page. You can do it on the, in the middle of the newspaper, but you got to do it. You have to set it up. Uh, plus, you have to do the training. I mean, one of the things in our recommendations is to really step up the training, particularly of Taiwan's forces. You know, Taiwan's been kept in a bubble as an isolated entity, not even a country. We don't consider it these days, at least officially, as a country. It's an entity. We don't have diplomatic relations. We have an embassy there, but you don't call it that. You know, and they're made up of retired, not active State Department people because you can't send active ones there. This is nonsense. I mean, so we have created this this hermetically sealed island, I guess you'd call it, but that's not the way it has to be done. I mean, it's it's an, it's an exaggeration, even of the deal that goes back to Kissinger and Nixon and the Chinese, and then later the Taiwan Relations Act. There's nothing that says we have to do it that way necessarily. Do it any way we want to do it. The derecognition of Taiwan, which is almost global now, is a very dangerous thing. The lack of our troops being able to train uh, the Taiwanese on modern systems, dangerous thing. The lack of coordination with their forces and our forces, dangerous thing. How do you fly American fighter planes around Taiwan when there's Taiwanese fighter planes in the air at the same time? How do they talk to each other? How do they coordinate? How do they not shoot each other down? I mean, there, there's a lot of problems here that need to be worked out and have been neglected, neglected and neglected. So. You know, what we're saying is don't, before you spend a lot of money, let's get organized properly. By the way, saying that, Japan very much would welcome it. I mean, everyone, the, the Japanese have turned around, you know, I think, on the need for defense. For one thing, they're going to increase their defense budget very substantially in the near future. But also, I think they've turned around on the need for coordinating the alliances and working with Taiwan, because that's a, they see Taiwan as critical to their national security now. Which is why they occupied it for 50 years. Well, they took it over in 1895. That's right. Uh, actually fought a war against the Taiwanese at the time, a uh, short one. And then they occupied it for 50 years until the surrender of Japan in 1945. It's, it's an unusual occupation, uh, as far as I know about it. I, I haven't studied it in depth. But talking to some of Taiwanese people, they don't have negative memories of the Japanese so much, interestingly. And many of them were educated in Japan in those years. Now, that's most of them are now either dead or retired. But, but still, the memories are not negative. And, and the Japanese do not have negative attitudes about Taiwan at all. 
In fact, the emperor uh, went to the nearest Japanese island to Taiwan, which is about 60 miles away, and where you can actually see the mountains of Taiwan from that island. And as they say, the emperor waved at Taiwan. <laughs> this is to send a message, you know, to send a message. We're with you. We're going to be here. I think the mood has changed radically in that part of the world. I mean, it's a do or die now. They're up against the big gorilla. And either they're going to do something about it or they're going to get crushed. And I think that's much more of a threat than having a common command. I do remember, by the way, clambering around the old Japanese concrete pillboxes in the mountains. Oh, you do? In Taiwan. Yeah, yeah that was many years ago. But th there were tr traces of I'm sure there were. that occupation. So in your estimation, aside from its enormous impact on the United States, the loss of Taiwan would be of the most strategic consequence to Japan. Immediately, yes. Immediately. Yeah, because they're so close. And Do you I want think to spell that out a little too. Well, I mean, I think the, first of all, there's the sea passages out from China that we worry about. These not just the Taiwan Straits, but there are two other straits that are how the the Chinese Navy has to come out into the Pacific, and and that has to pass uh, the Ryukyu Islands, which belong to Japan, which the Japanese are now starting to think about fortifying, which they hadn't before. And we're thinking about fortifying with them, which is a good thing, because we, we have to show the, the Chinese that there's no free lunch here. You're not going to just assert your power without any restrictions. Secondly, the, the, the Chinese are claiming these islands, I'm not sure, yeah. uh, as they are claiming Okinawa. You say, well, this is really Chinese, as they're claiming islands off of Indonesia, as they're claiming islands off of uh, uh, and, and oil areas off of uh, Vietnam and so on. I mean, the they're, infamous they're, nine dash line. Nine dash line. So, so they are definitely making a lot of claims, a lot of pressure on these countries. Um, if they get Taiwan, they control the first island chain, plain and simple. And our guys in Okinawa will probably need to leave because they'll be trapped. And I'm not sure whether we'll be able to keep our bases in Japan. I think there's a risk that the Japanese will say, well, the game's up. We better make accommodations with China, do what they want, get the Americans out. Well, so let's, let's talk about who else, whom else you would include in this common command structure. So Japan first and foremost. Well, Japan first and foremost. Korea would be important. Uh, Although the Koreans have their own problems, as you well know, I mean, North Korea being right there. Uh, but Korea is actually in air miles closer to Taiwan than, than the main parts of uh, the main island of, of Japan. So it, it's a very good jumping off place for us, for us, for us to do operations. And it hands the Chinese a big problem, which is the, part of the idea of our study. Our, our idea in the study is to make as many potential stumbling blocks for the Chinese as possible so that they can't just concentrate on Taiwan and think they're going to get away with it, that they have all these other things to deal with. And that's what we want them to believe. And we have to demonstrate that, of course. So yes, Korea. Uh, I think Australia, for sure. I doubt New Zealand will come in, but you never know. I mean, New Zealand's a funny place. It's possible. And they are part of the Five Eyes system, which is the intelligence sharing we have with uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Britain, and ourselves. That's five, I think, if, I can't, if I'm counting right. Uh, so, yeah, that's possible. Australia seems to be taking the threat very seriously. I think they are, yes. And now, this, just this past few days, uh, they uh, had a, a serious incident with a Chinese uh, spy ship that was hovering around their main uh, submarine bases which we also share with the Australians, uh, trying to intercept communications, trying to understand vulnerabilities, that kind of thing. And then, uh, the Australians have protested to China, but that will do them no good, of course. The Chinese will say, you know, too bad. Um, so they, they definitely have, they're under pressure and they know it. The Solomon Islands thing, by the way, is bad news for Australia and is bad news for New Zealand. And the New Zealanders didn't, who should have, 
didn't really fight very hard to prevent that. Australia has spoken out very strongly against the Solomon Islands agreement with the Chinese. Yeah, after the fact. After the fact, and uh, I don't know the specifics of that uh, uh, agreement between the Solomon Islands and China, but one would suspect they would like to fortify it. Yeah, everyone expects there to be military installations, but that's the that's the that's the bribe, so to speak. You know. As you know, uh, Steve, there's been a recent election in the Philippines, and a member of the Marcos family is that's right. coming back in. Uh, would you ex how does the Philippines fit within your schema? Well, it's very strategic, location-wise. Um, the, the Marcos people are, I, I don't think there's going to be a big change in their policy. At least that's the speculation now. But we had been building up a better relationship there and, and having some military exercises. Um, and we actually help provide additional security for them from China where they're being challenged. So it's possible that we, we, we think it's an important place. So is Vietnam. Um, and the more we have diversified bases, depots, capabilities, communications hubs, whatever we can put in that region, the better. I don't recall Vietnam being mentioned in the paper. Well, we didn't mention it. Uh, uh, probably we should have. And would, would Vietnam be included in the common command structure? No, not no. I think the, the first, the common command structure has to be among close allies that are coordinating. They're not an ally. But they could become a resource. Well, they certainly historically have considered China an enemy. Oh, and right. of course, fought a, quite a war with China some years ago in which the Chinese were bloodied by the That's correct. Vietnamese forces. Yeah. Um, I don't know how... I, I do remember some years ago whether it was a Chinese general, defense minister, was speaking at a conference of, of Southeast Asian countries, and when one of them piped up, he responded to them, you're a small country and we're a big country. <laughs> I recall it was that, not inaccurate. <laughs> not inaccurate, but I recall the anecdote because I would think if your recommendations are followed, the first thing China would try to do, I mean, it's, it's busy trying to do these things already, but um, because of the consequences for China of a common command structure, they would obviously increase the vigor with which they pursue it, just as the Soviet Union and Russia try to split up NATO. They would try to peel off the weak sisters in the relationship, probably uh, with a bag of goodies in terms of economic aid, yeah. And then, of course, with the mailed fist saying, you're a small country and we're a big one. The thing that complicates that is that in many cases, they're after some of the resources of these countries, like oil. Yes, of course. So so they put that ahead of peeling them off, so to speak, or bribing them. Uh, they're putting a lot of pressure on them. Um, and uh, so it's not a black and white thing by any means. But sure, they'll do whatever they can do. Does in Indonesia fit within a common yes. command structure? Well, not in common command yet. It, it fits into potential friend and ally, like Singapore. Uh, it's also a country, it's a tiny city-state, but it has a very good air force and a very good army. One of the things you mentioned in here, in fact, it's the fifth recommendation, is, is what we'd have to be able to do is gain, maintain, and sustain air superiority over both Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits. Yes, right. Uh, that seems like a big order in terms of the uh, improving Chinese capabilities. And how far are we from doing precisely that, gaining, maintaining, and sustaining air superiority in that area? I think we're not in bad shape if we're coordinated. Uh, first of all, we have F-35s, our own, and Japan has them. Uh, these are stealth aircraft. Um, they have uh, excellent weapons. Uh, they can coordinate a lot because of the, the, the new kinds of radars that they have and the electronics that they have, the computers that they're flying. They're essentially, each one is a flying command post. 
uh, and it can hand off targets. It can do all sorts of things that were simply impossible before. So they're, we're strong in that. We have the F-22, which absolutely the Chinese are fearful of, which is a pure stealth aircraft. We don't have a lot of them. We have enough for right now. Uh, we have the B-2 bomber, which is a stealth bomber, which we can fly from anywhere we want to. Uh, Guam, or from we can fly them into Japan and fly out of Japan. We, we can do, fly them out of Korea. I mean, there's lots of places we can fly them from. Uh, so we have air power. Japan has air power. By the way, Taiwan has pretty good air power, and we're upgrading their old F-16s with the new uh, radars, new electronically scanned radars, and much improved cockpits and uh, lots of other electronics. Uh, and and that's and they're going to be getting new F-16s, a new version of them soon. Uh, so I think the air power picture, and by the way, I've not even talked about Korea, but Korea has a lot of its own too. So all in all, I think we have formidable capabilities that overmatch China, even today, even today. And I think the Chinese know that. Uh, the question is, will we bring it to bear? You know, do, or is it a threat to China? Uh, if we do, again, if we try to do it by ourselves, it's less of a threat than if we try to do it with our allies and friends. And anyway, we need their bases. It certainly seems if China could not maintain air superiority over the Taiwan Straits, any attempted evasion would be a miserable failure. We thought that was sort of number one on the list. So that's why you have it up yeah, there. Yeah, right. And number two is air defenses, because we need to improve the air defenses. They're, they're not as good as they should be, although the Aegis uh, uh, naval air defense system, which is on our uh, destroyers and our cruisers, uh, is very excellent, we think. And poses, you know, it has it can do two things. It could it can knock out Chinese air power, but it can also knock out Chinese missiles. And especially the one the Chinese are counting on, called the called the DF twenty one D, which is a, they call it the carrier buster. They're going to shoot it at our carriers, maybe from a thousand miles away, and sink them. Well, if there's an Aegis cruiser next to our carrier, they're not going to do that, I don't think, because they'll, they'll shoot them down. So I think that the, the you know, that all these are factors in making it difficult, if not impossible, for China to prevail if we do it right. But we need to keep a strong naval presence in the region, which we're doing. You know, of course, we have a carrier based in Japan and Yokohama. Uh, we have a carrier task force, I should say. Uh, we are constantly moving ships in, and now we just went through the Taiwan Straits, which made the, which was a Ticonderoga class cruiser with Aegis, which angered the Chinese. They're complaining about it. Good, let them complain. That's the kind of thing we want them to see and feel. Before we go on to the Navy, Steve, several times in this paper, uh, you repeat that the United States Air Force today is the smallest and oldest it has ever been. That's right. That it's true because the the uh, a lot of the equipment, uh, not so much the F-35s because they haven't really been used in combat, but the F-16s and the F-15s have been heavily used in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and worn out. I think you say that the average uh, age of our aircraft is 30 years old. About that. Well, if you consider the B-52 bomber. That's even older. <laughs> that's the, the grandchildren of the original pilots are, are flying them. So, yeah, they're 50 years old. That's a lot. <laughs> so how serious uh, is it being taken in the United States, in the Defense Department and in the defense budget, that this is a crucial need if you're going to meet the requirement of maintaining air superiority over the Taiwan Straits. I think that, yeah, I think the budget is short, falls short. Uh, it's, that, look, first they cut the number of F-35s they're going to buy this coming, in this coming fiscal year, which is bad news. Shouldn't be cutting. They're talking about retiring F-22s, which they shouldn't be talking about. We need them. We need them very much. They should be maintaining them and improving them. Uh, they don't want to invest in them. Of course, you know the A-10 story, trying to get rid of it, uh, and yet it's a great ground attack airplane. Once you clear the skies away from 
Chinese aircraft and they could have a field day against Chinese ships. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have an aging Air Force and National Guard airplanes are really old. Uh, so we have to do a lot of work to improve it. And it's the, the budget doesn't show that. In fact, right. if you take inflation into account, the budget's down four or five percent. Uh, you say the Aegis system is effective as everything I understand about it, and, I'm the, and, and our our uh, naval experts, our admiral, who looked at this, uh, believes it to be true, uh, is that is that our Aegis is our best air defense system that we have. Well, you remark in the study that along China's coast across the Taiwan Strait, they have 1,600 missiles. That's right. And they've been adding to this number of missiles That's in correct. a rather steady pace. So even if there is an effective air defense, there won't be enough of it. They can overwhelm. Well, I mean, but don't think about that. That says they have a free lunch and they can shoot all those missiles off with impunity. But, I mean, if they're going to launch missiles, uh, we're going to knock out their missile launching sites. So, it, it, you know, it's, we're going to reduce their capability. Now, that doesn't mean we have enough air defenses, and certainly Taiwan does not. In fact, I, I don't know if you know, but the, the Navy has proposed retiring the Ticonderoga-class cruisers starting now, seven, get rid of seven of them. That are actually the one that just sailed through the Taiwan Straits is on the list to be decommissioned, and and this strikes us as crazy. And I've written separately, not in the study, but separately that if we don't want them, give them to the Japanese and to the Taiwanese. They they don't know what to do with them, and and, and it, it, you don't have to build them from scratch. They're there. Okay, they may need a little work, but that's a lot cheaper than trying to build. Because if you start to build a ship today with a sophisticated air defense system that's five years or more before you'll see one. And we need them now. So they're trying to retire those, which is incomprehensible to me. And then as far as the uh, destroyers are concerned, which also have uh, Aegis uh, on them, uh, they've only put, uh, these are called Arleigh Burke class destroyers. Uh, they've only put one in the budget and they're willing to increase it by one. Well, that's not nearly enough. We need a lot more of them. That's because that's the best air defense capability we have. Ground defense, ground-based air defenses like Patriot and so on, uh, I think are of limited value. Uh, it's an old system. It's been upgraded many times. But we've watched it in Saudi Arabia and the UAE trying to shoot down Houthi missiles, which are not the latest and the greatest. And they've had difficulty. So it seems to me that that... We can't rely on that. We need we need the Aegis very badly, and we need something also called Aegis Assure. This is the same Aegis system, but on land. Uh, we we're putting it in Poland and in uh, Romania now. Actually, I think it's already installed uh, because it can you know to face the Russians. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be putting it uh, in Taiwan. Okay, uh, also in Japan. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's it's for our security as much as anyone else's. So, I think the, uh, the you have several proposals in here, the, the common command structure to include Taiwan. That's right. And then the training of Taiwanese military. Uh, Can I say something about that? Please do. I mean, we have trained the Ukrainian forces. That was going to be my point. <laughs> I stole your stuff. <laughs> but uh, we thought, you know, train up the Ukrainians, give them a strategy, teach them how to use a lot of the equipment, not big equipment, but stuff they could, you know, stuff they could do. And they've had a tremendous impact on the Russians. Indeed. The one Ukrainian said uh, about Russia, the Russian invasion, they're eight years too late. I think that's correct. Because that's how long... There have been Western military trainers in there uh, training them and upgrading their equipment. So that leads to my question pertaining to Taiwan. What Russia moved when you when you see there wasn't any imminent threat Russia was facing when it decided to invade Ukraine. Right. 
But they thought there was. But that's, well, they uh, thought there was because in November there was a, a strategic partnership signed between the United States and Ukraine, which included that Ukraine will be a part of NATO. That, you have that in addition to Putin's clear knowledge that the Ukrainian military was being upgraded that's every right. year, if not every day. And presumably because of that, or at least one of the big reasons why he decided to go now rather than later is that it would be harder later. So he decides to invade. Turns out to have been a, a miscalculation. Very big miscalculation. But mightn't China also reach that calculation if they see the Taiwanese military being physically upgraded, well, the personnel yeah, that, are, uh, are being improved in their training, and that therefore they're going to be facing a much tougher nut to crack, and they better crack it sooner rather than later. Well, the, the counter argument to that is if you do nothing, they'll go away. No, they'll, they'll keep coming anyway. So I think you have no choice. You have to train. And, you know, we haven't really trained the Taiwanese. A little bit for pilots in the United States, but only in the United States. What about the argument that the Taiwanese haven't really trained themselves? They they have a military service requirement of a, what, is it even a full 12 months? I don't even know if they have conscription anymore. It's pretty spare. So yeah. they're... they're no, they need a... There's no training in depth even by them. I think the Taiwanese need a kick in the pants. Uh, just like the Japanese have... Now they don't need it so much. I think they've, they're coming around. But I think the Taiwanese have... The Taiwanese have done what others have done. So, well, if the Americans are going to defend us, then we can't win anyway because you, your studies keep telling us that we're going to lose anyway. So why should we do anything? Let the Americans take care of it if they can. Um, that's a terrible attitude, by the way. Terrible attitude, big mistake. The Japanese in learning, that's a big mistake. Now, the Japanese have some some historical reasons, like the peace treaty they signed in 1945 that restricted the size of their military forces and made them into a homeland defense only. Uh, so, I mean, to some degree, we... We, we didn't want them to remilitarize, to re, right. you know, we, we were against it. And, and they lived off of that for a long time because then they could, well, we don't really need a defense budget because the Americans will take care of it. So they're on welfare, right? That's what you call welfare. Like Germany. Yeah, like very much like Germany. Yeah. And now the Germans are starting to understand that maybe they uh, took uh, too much of their own risk. So uh, the bottom line here is that I think all these guys have to shape up, but it will shape up better if we get in there and start training them because then I think they'll understand what their deficits are. And and they'll lose... If, if their military guys are arguing we're okay, okay, the politicians will understand from what the Americans are telling them because they're there, they're not okay. They need to improve. And they do need to improve. There's, I, I visited a number of bases in Taiwan uh, also on Kim Man Kimoy, which Kimoy, is called, Matsu. Yeah, yeah, not Matsu. I've never been there, but I was in uh, uh, Ma, uh, Kinmen, it's Kinmen Province, which is right up against China. Um, I guess four times, three, four times. Mm. Uh, I toured all the. It's it, most of it's underground, by the way. <laughs> it's very I know, I've been highly there. fortified. But uh, if you look at the equipment, it's seventy-five years old. It's old stuff. Uh, it really badly needs to be upgraded. So there's forty-eight A three tanks, which we were using in the Korean War. That's right, that's right. Well, they've they have uh, tried to improve them, but you know you've seen what happened in, in Ukraine with tanks. Uh, unless you have ap active protection systems on them, you can kiss them goodbye today, <laughs> because they're going to be knocked out by drones. They're going to be knocked out by anti tank weapons. What what about that? If you well, first of all, before we get to the question I was just about to ask you, uh, let's let's go a little more deeply into the U.S. Navy because you, you make that a serious part of this very much study. So. Yeah, because our Navy is as small as it's ever been, I believe. Uh, it's quite small. Yeah, yeah. And uh, facing a much larger. In fact, uh, the Navy uh, just came out and said, you know, we can't fight 
two wars at the same time. We, we no longer have that capability. So if we're going to be in Europe, we're not going to be in the Pacific. If we're going to be in the Pacific, we're not going to be, you know, I think they're facing up to the reality that uh, they don't have enough ships. They don't have enough sailors. Uh, that you can't fix overnight. You know, that takes years to, to repair. I remember when I was in the Pentagon, it was about 3,000 years ago, uh, John Lehman was, became the Secretary of the Navy, and he said, we're going to have a 600-ship Navy. Well, we don't have that today. We're, what have we got, 380, something like that? And a lot of them are, you know, not really ships. I mean, not really fighting ships. They're oilers and supply ships, and hospital ships. And he goes on and on. I mean, the, the, the fighting ships are fairly limited. We have, we have uh, 11 aircraft carriers, of which six or seven of them can operate at any one time. The rest of them are in repair. Uh, one of them's in terrible shape right now. Uh, they have sailors committing suicide on these ships. Can you believe it? Well, I mean, the, the operational tempo that the Navy has to keep today... Yeah, because they're running this and this and this and this. ...is yeah. extremely punishing. And if they're short on manpower, one reason it might be that no one wants to get into a, a, a meat grinder in terms of... It's a shortage of manpower wearing out the guys and ladies. And uh, the ships. And the ships. Uh, it's a lack of parts and spare parts and a lot of equipment's deteriorated. It's bad conditions on many of these ships that they haven't, uh, haven't re re dealt with. There's, there are a lot of, what can we call them, uh, infrastructure problems in the Navy and, and in the other services too that have been allowed to, uh, to, to deteriorate, I think, way beyond where they should be. Well, in meeting these needs, uh, Steve, we could recall the, the rapid pace at which the United States in World War II met the needs of the U.S. Navy turning out a phenomenal number of ships. Uh, yeah. But that industrial base is gone to a large extent. No, it's gone to a period. Uh, yeah. We have you know one yard now that can build sure. big ones like carriers. We have some smaller yards that can do smaller ships. Um, but remember that in World War II, that in I was at 38 or 39, two years or three years before the war started, Congress, one of the few things Congress did, that, which was really incredible and it's very smart, was to finance building up the Navy. So by the time the war started, we were well, well ahead in terms of, you know, the new ships coming online. And yes, it, Pearl Harbor was a mess, but happily they didn't get our carriers because they weren't there. Uh, and that was fortuitous. But I think bottom line was we were at least partly ready because of, because of the uh, wisdom of the Congress in, in, I believe it was 39, in, in funding the Navy on a, on a large scale. So the lack of the in industrial infrastructure and the lead time uh, for building a major combatant ship. Right. Uh, uh, Don't look for new ships. If there's a conflict, that means it's not going to happen. The world has changed, but it's changed for almost all defense products. The, the, the navy, the, the navy, the the the, uh, the Raytheon, for example, is saying, if you want more javelins or you want more, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, the stingers, uh, two years, maybe. I mean, they don't have the, they can't surge. They don't have a surge capability. There's been lots of attempts to build a surge capability, but no one wants to, wanted to fund it over the last 30 years. I remember when I was in the Pentagon years ago, we talked about a surge capability and tried to convince Congress to allocate money for it. They weren't interested. No. So we don't have that. So whatever happens is going to happen fast, and it better happen fast, uh, because that's the only thing, the only kind of conflict we could sustain. Let's talk about the carriers just for a minute. I remember uh, talking with an admiral, uh, a retired admiral, as these new Chinese capabilities were coming online with hypersonic missiles and right. uh, starting to, uh, with the range you mentioned, a thousand miles. And when I said to him, well, why, how can the Navy protect itself and the carriers when the Chinese have these capabilities? He said, well, they just have to be further out. But at a certain point, they get 
too far out to respond effectively. Now, with that remark, let me at the same time say, if carriers are so vulnerable, why the heck are the Chinese building them? There used to be a joke about a certain foreign country, and it said, you know, how that country gets to see, it has glass bottoms on its ships, so it can see the previous Navy <laughs> that it had. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, carriers for China are prestige. Prestige. Yes. It shows that they can power project, they can go around the world, and they can do things. Without them, they can't. So that's why they have them. Are they vulnerable? Damn right they are. Uh, especially theirs are vulnerable. Why especially? To, because they don't they don't really have the missile defenses around their carriers that we do. I think we're better at that. They'll get there, but they don't have it yet. Uh, hypersonics, I don't know yet. The Russians have fired a few of them in the Ukraine war. Uh, they don't seem to have made any particular difference. So I don't know if, if that's just... If the, if that's just an exhibition, you know, we have them, we can shoot them, or whether they had some hopes that they would swing the war around, I doubt it. Uh, but they're going to, you know, we're going to have hypersonic weapons. We're working on them very hard. So are the Chinese, uh, and the Russians are too. So they'll they'll be part of the scene. They're not right now. I think we're five to ten years away. We haven't touched upon the uh, ground forces, the U.S. Army, the the Marines. Right. We have very good army uh, army capabilities and very good, very, very good marine capabilities. So one of the difficulties, in my estimation, it's not a, we haven't put this in the book, but I think is what's the mission of the Marines? You know, there's the, they're in the process of trying to change the nature of the U.S. Marines. And, and there's a lot of uh, retired Marines, very serious, uh, capable people who are very skeptical of the changes that are being proposed. But one of the systems that the Marines have uh, is this HIMARS uh, artillery system, long-range artillery. It's a rocket, multiple launch rocket with very, very high precision. Uh, that gives us a chance, and by the way, it's just as good at hitting ships at sea as it is hitting land targets. So if there's an attempted invasion, I think that, and if the Marines move the high Mars over to the Japanese islands, which is, I think, in the offing, it's going to happen. Uh, Yonaguni is the island. Uh, then I think the Chinese are going to have a problem. So that's, that's, that's positive. I think the Marines have a, a key role to play in, in blunting an invasion. And the Army, too. But I think, in the first instance, the Marines. With we weapons such as those, it wouldn't seem to be at all an insuperable problem to keep the Chinese hemmed in to that first island chain out of which they're trying to break and, and obviously which they'd succeed in breaking out if they conquered Taiwan. But, but short of a successful conquest, if, as you suggested, the Japanese uh, Militarizes Senkaku Islands, that that presents a real problem for China. I think so. Yeah, and plus they're quite mountainous these islands, so it's not going to be easy to hit things there uh, if that's your intent. So yeah, I mean I think that uh, definitely uh, putting assets on those islands, air defenses and uh, strike forces is very important. Now, one of the revelations of the war in Ukraine that uh, surprised many of our senior military leaders was the ineptness of these Russian forces at um, coordination, interoperability, communications. Um, especially communications. Especially communications, but they didn't coordinate, you know, air and ground and, uh, and therefore lost quite a bit from that. And we wonder, how could that be? Because they are practiced in having these enormous military maneuvers that, that we could never observe because they wouldn't allow us to. Uh, but apparently this wasn't a regular part of their training. So the question, uh, I don't know whether that would make us 
a little more optimistic about the problem that China is presenting in relation to Taiwan, because that would have to be an inter-services coordination for them to pull that off successfully. Right. And they haven't had really any real world operational experience in, in doing that. So we, we, is now, there the a last time they fought a war was against Vietnam and they lost it. And they lost it, right. <laughs> and they, they were fighting with... But that the, was a long, you know, that was many years ago and, and they've vastly improved their, right. their capabilities since then. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think you can draw any lessons from that. Uh, we don't know. I mean, to put it in the simplest terms, we don't know. But if the Russian example is of, of any relevance to China, uh, they may have some serious vulnerabilities in terms of capabilities and communications, command and control. Um, and if you can knock out their command and control, they may really be in trouble because they don't delegate down to the battalion level a lot of independence of movement and action. So it's all from the top down. Which is another problem the Russians experience. Very much so. That's why all these Russian generals are getting knocked off, because they they have to get in front of the forces, and that's a very bad place to be to run a war, unless you're Patton. But I didn't see any Pattons there in, the, in Ukraine. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, a very significant point. The other thing about the, the Russians, which surprised everybody, is they, they, they apparently didn't distribute secure communications capabilities to their troops. So they were using open radios, and in many cases, cell phones. In fact, yesterday I saw a remarkable map. The, the, the map was showing where all the Russian troops were by tracking their, the, the IDs of their cell phones. So they had all these cell phones that lit up, and you can see it all in eastern Ukraine and down into uh, uh, Mariupol and across into Kyrgyzstan, and, and, and it's all lit up by, and you could figure out how many troops are there. Well, another explanation. It's crazy, actually. Yeah. Another explanation for the poor performance of the Russian military is corruption. Yeah. Now, we know in the past that corruption was a very serious problem in the Chinese military. Yes. That if you wanted to be a flag officer, well, corruption is a big problem in China altogether. Yeah, but I mean, you had to buy your position. Yes. So it didn't necessarily relate to any military competence. But then once you got the position, let's say you would you would farm it. You would get that money back and more. You know, that was a problem well before President Xi came into power. And of course, cleaning up corruption is the excuse he's used to remove political opponents. That's right. But he's also... I think, serious about building up the Chinese military. Of course, Putin was serious about building up the Russian military and didn't work. What do you, do you have any idea or did members of your panel address that did subject? Not. We did not take that up because, yeah. because it's, it's all speculation. I mean, we don't, we don't know. know. Yeah. I mean, we didn't really know about the, even now no one really knows if the problem the Russians had was, was corruption or bad command system. Uh, or bad equipment. I mean, there, there's a lot of, there, there was a story that says, it's not a story actually, it's proven, that a lot of the components that the Russians have inside their equipment have come from U.S. and U.K. and other countries because they don't make it. Um, and that most recently they're even yanking computers and equipment out of dishwashers and <laughs> putting, using them in the military. Uh, for military purposes. So, you know, one of the things that differs Russia from China very significantly is Russia does not have a c commercial infrastructure of any significance compared to the United States or compared to China. China is a very big one. Uh, and these days, our military here draws a significant part of its capabilities in terms of electronics, sensors, things of that sort, from the commercial sector. Including from China. Unfortunately, including from China, but also from Taiwan. Yes. Because Taiwan Semi is providing some very important equipment to our military. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's but that's called globalization. Yeah. <laughs> but, but 
having, even, even if you put that over here, the fact is we still have a very deep infrastructure in this country. Uh, and people invest in it. In China, even Americans invest in Chinese, you know, and they've done it. I think they're getting a little bit uh, gun, shy. gun shy now because of the Chinese economy and because of Chinese practices. But Russia more or less, I mean, chased them away, chased the Western capitalists away, even after communism, made it a kind of hostile place to operate. So the amount of investment in Russia is quite small comparatively speaking, and nothing happened like what happened in China. There's no, there was no commercial takeoff like in China. Now, why can't we think of Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier? We can, except you have to remember that Taiwan is under uh, missile threat. So the first thing, everyone believes that the first thing the Chinese will hit are the airfields. There are quite a few of them, but they'll still try to hit them all. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we could do, but we haven't done, is to take the version of the F-35, the stealth plane, that can do vertical takeoff and provide them to, to Taiwan because then they can't be targeted because they don't have to operate from an airfield or from a runway. Uh, and they can be hidden in different places. And I think that's quite an, it's an important idea. We shouldn't really do it. What about Taiwan's missile capabilities? They they have some of their indigenous capabilities. Uh, I don't know how good they are. I really don't. So I, I can't really comment. But I mean, they don't have anything uh, comparable to what the United States can, can provide. Well, wouldn't that considerably complicate the situation for China? Were they to have... Yeah, well, I mean, Iran that's why missiles? you'd want to give them all kinds of things like harpoons. Yeah. And my, I, I just saw that the, the harpoon deliveries to Taiwan have been delayed. And I don't know why. I honestly don't know why. I'm not sure the Taiwanese know why. But that's the sort of thing you don't want to delay, delayed. You want to get those things. They're, they're anti-ship missiles. They're, they're good. I mean, they're not the best, but they're good. Um, and, and they can really be helpful, especially if the Chinese try anything. Because you can sink a lot of ships with them. Uh, and that's just the kind of thing that they really do need. HIMARS would be a very good system that China, the Taiwanese want them. Uh, whether they'll be able to get them or not, I don't know. But that would help them. In the past, I should say something about this, because in the past, the U.S. didn't want to sell anything to Taiwan that could be used against China, against the mainland, uh, which... I, I thought was kind of a bad policy. The, one of the things that we, we did, for example, when we sold them the F-16s was we, we didn't give them any ground attack capability or anything worthwhile. Uh, when the Ty Taiwan decided to build its own indigenous fighter, it's called the FCK-1, uh, we gave them engines that were not capable of reach, really reaching China and coming back so that you know they were very short we called short legged they could only fly the little circles around the island so i mean we did things which were i think almost punitive in a way that we didn't need to do and and of course that when you realize you have these limitations it also is demoralizing so one of the reasons maybe the taiwanese sit on their hands is because they think that they're just not going to get the kind of systems and weapons they need uh, what should we uh, learn from the way in which the war is being fought in Ukraine? What do you think the Chinese are learning? I mean, the employment of the Turkish drones and other kinds of drones that have inflicted such damage on Russian armor and uh, other vehicles, uh, the, the anti-ship missiles the Ukrainians have used to take out a cruiser-level command ship of the Russians in the Black Sea, uh, ostensibly, yes. Ostensibly. Yeah. Uh, what, what would you suggest the lessons of this might be for the defense of Taiwan? Well, even even before Ukraine, if you look at the Nagorno-Karabakh war. Yes. Which is an, even a better example. Turkish and the Israeli uh, Harap 
a stealthy drone, uh, smashed the Russian air defense systems, took them out, uh, destroyed armor, uh, artillery. convoys, artillery, emplacements, all that, uh, mobile and fixed. So, I mean, it was quite uh, impressive. Now, it wasn't the only reason that the war went against the Armenians. The Azerbaijanis fought hard. Uh, they did a good job, I think. But they also used these to tremendous effect. Uh, so we learned that already from Nagorno-Karabakh, that that was a fairly decisive system, systems to use. Uh, in, in the, I think in Ukraine, we've seen what can happen if you don't have active protection systems on your tanks. Okay? We've seen what can happen if you don't have a way to defend against drones. See, the Russians didn't seem to have any. Uh, you know, it's very funny because if you remember in, in, when the Russians were in Afghanistan, the U.S. sold the, the Mushahadeen uh, air, ground-to-air missiles, man, can be called man pads, man-carried ground-to-air missiles, actually called Stinger. By the way, the same ones that the Ukrainians are using. That was 36 years ago, something like that, 36 years. The Russians had 36 years to prepare against, because they knew what they could do. They, they took a terrible beating. They were shooting down Russian helicopter gunships. They were shooting down Russian warplanes. They were shooting down Russian transports. Uh, that was 36 years ago. So, you know, you would think that the Russian military would have said, hey, priority number one, we don't want to get caught with these damn missiles again. We have to find a way to defend. They didn't. They didn't at all. In fact, they're flying airplanes today that are, that are almost completely unequipped with the right uh, defensive systems. Uh, they don't have targeting pods. They, they don't even have GPS. The fact that uh, there was a report that one of the crash, one of the most modern in SU-34 aircraft that was shot down, uh, when they saw the inside of the cockpit, the pilot had taped a commercial GPS onto the onto the dashboard, if you want to call it that, the, inside the airplane, so he knew where he, so he would know where he was. Well, I don't think the Chinese. Uh, they don't do that. Have that problem? No, they're. The, I think Chinese do good electronics. They know what they're doing. Um, no, I don't. Think, I think that that uh, that's not a. Uh, although I'm not sure how well they would do against drones, even though the Chinese build a hell of a lot of drones, military and commercial. In fact, they have 80, 80, 85 percent of the global commercial market for drones, small drones. These are quadcopters, you know, multiple four in, four propellers, but uh, which are also a problem because you could put a bomb on them. Uh, so you would think they would try to have developed something to deal with that threat. There's no sign of that, actually. So maybe we'd have an advantage. Steve, let me close by asking you, how can people get a hold of the study? How to uh, yeah. buy the book? <laughs> and where well, can the they book do that? is only on Amazon. OK. Uh, and you can get it on Amazon. It's there. Um, it's cheap. We made it as cheap as we could so that uh, three dollars and ninety nine cents for the printed version and I think it's two dollars and ninety nine cents for the Kindle version um, so it's, it's, it's not going to break your piggy bank you know, there's no inflation um, in this one in fact it's just about covering costs and I, I also want to mention that all the group including myself everybody involved worked as a volunteer nobody was paid one cent no one benefits one cent from this effort this is a this is something we did because we thought it was important for our country and for peace and security in the Pacific. Excellent. Well, thank you for doing that and for being the co-chairman of this panel that an honor, has actually. produced this very effective, powerful study, how to prevent an invasion of Taiwan. I want to thank Dr. Stephen Bryan for joining us uh, again to do a Westminster Institute program. And I encourage our audience to go to the Westminster Institute website to see what other programs we have on offer or to our YouTube channel, where you will find uh, two other talks on different subjects from Dr. Stephen Bryan, other programs, well, about Ukraine, Russia, uh, a, a number on the subject of China, Japan, Taiwan, and other subjects in the Middle East and elsewhere. 
Thank you for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley.